I'm here, classroom. I'm here. Don't you worry about me. I can feel the worry and the tension in you. Don't worry about it. I'm here. I, you know, this class is not, you know, my greatest strength. And so uh, I'm always a little bit trying to always prepare a little bit more for this class, just to be ready for this class. So that's what I was doing. And uh, let's get rolling, shall we? So what are we talking about today? Well, we're talking about U.S. president still going through Lincoln. We might get through president number 10 today. Jackson was number seven. Right? Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, John Quincy Adams, Andrew Jackson. And after J Andrew Jackson came... Van Buren, Martin Van Buren, and then William Henry Harrison, and then John Tyler. Oh, how about that? So those are our first through, that would be through number 10, right? Why don't you have the numbers here? You need to have the numbers in all my books, I swear. I need three books just to find the most simple information that we have here in the kids' book. Let's look at it. Let's do it. Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, uh, Adams, John Quincy Adams. <laughs> Read and know. Andrew Jackson, number seven. Martin Van Buren, number eight. William Henry Harrison, number nine. And John Tyler, number 10. Look at that. See how we go over this? We, we could take our time. We don't have to say this once and then forget about it. We're memorizing this. And, folks, I'm memorizing it along with you. And I just have to say, I'm proud of myself. I'm not a very good memorizer. And I've got the first 10 presidents memorized. Hopefully for good. Hopefully I won't forget it. Those last three now through Andrew Jackson. And I keep forgetting John Quincy Adams, who I liked a lot because he was so anti-slavery. And it doesn't mean that he was better than everybody else. I just like him because of that. And it wasn't easy to be anti-slavery, was it? No, Dr. Farovich, it probably wasn't. No, it wasn't. No, I can see that. So, especially because so much of the economy was dependent on it, right? Eli Whitney, that Eli Whitney knew what he was doing. Not only did Eli Whitney make the cotton gin, but he also did something else, which, which really, I, I got to find it, which was really surprising to me. I'm using my... Um, that encyclopedia, so here, on um, to library, of that library encyclopedia. It's got a wonderful section on this. This here is on history. So history of art, history of literature, history of the world. And then it goes into the world and talks about. So it's just this, and this is this volume only. This volume only. I mean, not that you're surprised by there's like a million volumes to an encyclopedia set. It, you're not surprised by that. But this only has three volumes. Not a million. Like all the others have a million. Eli Whitney. There it is. So, he developed, Eli Whitney not only developed the cotton gin, what the cotton gin did was it, if you've ever seen cotton seeds, they are just, 
you know, it's kind of like a milkweed, kind of like. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but if you to get the seeds out, it's very difficult because you have to remove those fibers. And the fibers are kind of tough fibers to pull apart, right? It's kind of, so you have to pull apart the fibers and then get those seeds out of there so that they can use the cotton, right? So they had to use the slaves in their fingers in order to do that. And that took a long time. From what I understand, it said... One pound of cotton per day per worker changed to 50 pounds of cotton. One pound of cotton per worker in a day changed to 50 pounds of cotton because of the cotton gin that um, Eli Whitney invented to get those seeds out of that cotton easier. 50 pounds of cotton now compared to one pound of cotton a day per worker. So you're beginning to see the beginnings of the industrial revolution, right? Where we are getting industrialized. Where industry via machinery is helping our economy, right? Okay. What else did Eli Whitney do? So this man... What a brain, what a brain to be such an inventor. That's just crazy to me. I don't even know, you know, I think about building a bridge, for example. Who who thought that they could build a bridge across, you know, over there, that Golden Gate Bridge, right? Who thought that they could do that? Joining, you know, San Francisco and Salinas there. I don't know who that brainiac was. I would have just like gone home and, drank myself into despair. <laughs> no. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows what I would have done at that time? I don't even know. So, developed a new method for manufacturing by creating interchangeable parts. Whitney secured a contract to provide 10,000 muskets to the United States government. He opened a factory uh, near New Haven, Connecticut and develop machines to produce uniform, interchangeable parts for the firearms. This meant that relatively unskilled workers could produce an enormous number of muskets. Do you know what a musket is? Most of you probably do. Do you know what a musket is? A musket is a gun. So Eli Whitney, first gun producer. What up? What up, Eli? Okay. That's what I wanted to say about Eli Whitney. All right, so why did I say that? About slavery, we're talking about slavery, we're talking about the South, and we're talking about actually, I should have called this something different. I should have called it U.S. President's posturing. I, I was thinking about that. Posturing. Do you know what posturing is? Like a like, here's my posture, right? So if I stand straight up, I have good posture, right? But I don't always stand like this with good posture, right? I don't always stand like this. But if I'm posturing, I would, right? So posturing is literally like the idea that I am going to present myself in a very credible, professional Whatever kind of way you need me to be, whatever picture you need me to look like, right? That's posturing. That's posturing, right? So if you need me to look like a poor farmer or, you know, a backwoodsman, uh, I will make sure that that's what it looks like. Let me give you an example. Uh, William Henry Harrison, president number nine, Was it him? I got to get it right. Said he was born in a log cabin. And although he was born in a log cabin, he was actually, they were actually very wealthy and they were only in the log cabin while their mansion was being built. That's posturing. Okay? So, making it look like he is from... 
a poor log cabin No, hold on. Maybe it wasn't. He was born. William Henry Harrison was born in a log cabin, but I'm not sure if he was the one posturing or not. It seems like he was, but maybe it was. Yes. Yes, it was. It was William Henry Harrison. Over the years, many presidential candidates have done their best to show voters that they are just ordinary folks. And none was more successful at doing this than William Henry Harrison. Harrison ran for president by emphasizing his humble origins on the frontier. When it's while it's true that he was born in a log cabin, the whole truth is that the log cabin was a temporary home around which his father's mansion was being built. His family was actually wealthy. And now you're starting to get an idea of, you know, it was so interesting to me, the early presidents and how they really weren't wealthy. And they really weren't dependent on the federal government paying them, right? And if they're not dependent on the federal government paying them, then they're using their own funds to fight the war, to become president, to, to campaign, to move their political aspirations, like for for reasons in their hearts, right? They weren't they weren't like, woo woo, I'm a Republican, woo woo, I'm a Whig. No. What they were doing is is they were saying, I am this because I'm not that. I'm not Andrew Jackson was was a big uh, kind of commentary basically going on. And the Whig party at the time was simply anti-Andrew Jackson. And now we've seen lots of reasons why people might be anti-Andrew Jackson. And then we played the song by Cody Johnson, I'm Only Human, right? Okay, so let's start there. But I'm sorry that I have to plug in first. Okay, so let me go get my plug in and I will be right back. Okay, so three major problems are plaguing us right now, as we have said numerous times. <laughs> what does that even mean? Numerous times. As we've said numerous times, we have got a number of problems plaguing us. Three main problems. And the three main problems consist of... the two-party system. Now, I want to give you just a little bit more, although, you know, it is a two-party system. We never planned for it. There is no provisions in the Constitution for running or electing people from a two-party system. And you can see that with William Henry Harrison's death, there also became lots of questions about how would they handle the death of a president and who would succeed him, right? Or succeed him. Succeed. I don't, succeed him? I'm not sure. Who would come after him, right? The president. So we had to resolve that problem when William Henry Harrison died in office 
32 days after he was inaugurated. This is so interesting. You just talk about posturing. That is, if there is a lesson to be learned, William Henry Harrison th seemed to me to be posturing an awful lot. So we're going to get to him in just a minute, right? So we talked a little bit about him just to kind of, you know, whet your appetite about him, kind of give you a little hook about him. He was really interesting. Shortest uh, tenure as president, 32 days. But he was always, seemed to me, to be posturing. And so let's get back to the two-party system. So we've got, um, uh, and he was a Whig as well. So we've got basically Andrew Jackson, who is running the country like a dictator, right? Despite what he claims from his mouth, when you take a look at his behaviors, he was really dictatorial. So much so that uh, his vice president, Van Buren, was pro-Jackson, but after that, the parties were so distancing themselves that the party, the Whig party, became a party simply as an anti-Jackson party, okay? Now here, <clears throat> I want to read again from the kids' book, Everything Kids President's book. I want to read from that one about the Whig party. So right here from this book right here, I'm going to read right here. All right. So in British history, the Whigs were a political party that opposed the harsh and oppressive rule of a king because in their eyes, President Andrew Jackson seemed to be trying to rule the same way. His political opponents joined together and used the same name Whig. So that's how the Whig party came along. So in direct opposition, the, the Whig Party in this country came about, in direct opposition to Andrew Jackson, who claimed to be a statesman and for the people, right, and yet ruled as if he were the only one making the rules for the federal government, ruling as if he believed in a strong federal government. And now, as I said, we're leading up to the Civil War. And so things to keep your eyes on are these three major problems because that's what is leading up to this Civil War. So in the Civil War, the North was considered... Let's start with the South because you already know what the South was considered. They were the Confederates, right? They were the Confederates. And so Confederates really are talking about seceding from the Union and becoming their own country, making their own rules that was more about states' rights. We see that we've got a problem with finances when the states are making their own money and doing their own thing. The South in the Civil War was considered the Confederates. The North was considered what? The Union. The Union. Did you know that? I mean, you probably remember it, right? But so when you think about what is the Civil War about, well, it's about these three issues. But the main issue is what kind of power should the federal government have and can the states or should the states basically govern themselves? And the whole problem with that is finances. How do we function as a unified country when we might have currency that's different from state to state? Laws that are different from state to state. How do you enforce a law as a federal government when it's different in Georgia compared to Mississippi? How do you do that, right? So you can see that there is, and this is what is so important, I think. 
if we go right back to George Washington, you see great passion in starting this country. And although we can criticize Andrew Jackson, and I'm going to criticize William Henry Harrison as well for some of the same kinds of reasons, which is posturing, right? Which is, I'm a warrior and we're going to get rid of the savages in this country. So this is the claim that many of the presidents are kind of making. But we need to step back for a second and really quiz ourselves on whether or not we believe that we would have this country, a democratic country that we have today, you know, flaws and all, if we didn't do, if we didn't have an Andrew Jackson. If we didn't have an Andrew Jackson, would we have a unified United States of America. You know, I would never be a proponent of somebody who treated the Cherokees so very specifically and the Choctaw Indians, but specifically the Cherokee Indians. You could never be a proponent of a person who treated the Cherokee Indians the way that he did. And yet, and yet, would we have the United States that we have today if it wasn't for some of these? Um, and they're fighting for democracy in their own way, right? They're fighting for democracy. They really are fighting for democracy. Um, but democracy for the few, not democracy for the many right we're still going to talk about the political systems don't think i forgot have forgotten about that it's so important to talk about that you can be an elected official and become and be a dictator as well right so you can have a democracy and you can also have a dictator at the same time it's the way he runs one's an election and one is the way that the um, powers are executed Right? One is how do we elect our officials, and the other one is the way that the powers are executed. Right? So you can't elect a dictator. The problem is, is that you probably won't have an election after that. That's the problem. Seriously, really, think about it. Yes, you can have a democracy, and yes, you can vote in a dictator, but that dictator is going to take away your democracy by definition. He's a dictator. Hello? So all these things that we are thinking about and, and, and um, mulling over politically in our minds, right, in our hearts, and more than our minds, in our hearts, are problems that we see were established in becoming a free country. What do we do? So this is where we left off talking about the banks, all right? So I've got, uh, what I tried to do there for you with the talk that we've had so far is to try and fill in some of the blanks, right? You've got a lot of bricks for the foundation, but there's not a lot of mortar between the bricks that's connecting all of this, all right? So we want to connect all of this. So problem number two we talked about was the National Bank, and you hear Andrew Jackson, and I've talked about Andrew Jackson being against the second national bank. He was against the first national bank, and then he was against the second national bank. And then in my mind, you think, well, in my mind, I think, okay, well, there's bank number two. But that's not the way that it is. That's not the way we don't have bank number two. What that was was a law for the bank. But the law for the bank, a first national bank, the law to have a bank had a limit, a time limit on it, as many of our laws do. Voting Rights Act of 1964 has not been passed again. There was a time limit on it, and it's perceived as being unnecessary. No, it's not unnecessary. It's not unnecessary. Just like we see these kinds of laws for banks are necessary. So there was a time limit on the law, the laws provided for that provided for the first national bank. And so they had to renew that law to provide for not a second bank, but the second national bank that replaced 
the first national bank, all right? And so there's a little, there's more to it. If you're interested in the banking industry, there's more to it. I find this a little fascinating, although economics are not my strong suit either. I'm a social gal, right? I'm a social gal, and that's where my strong suit is. It's why I don't know history as well or isn't. I'm learning along with you, right, and trying to give you the data that I think is important to give you a perspective about the psychology of these people, about the psychology of our history, because that's why. Why do I care about the psychology of our history? Why is it just history? Well, because why did we get where we are, right? What motivated us? To, to, to break out as a new country. I believe that, that all of um, who we are as a nation has to do with our psychology, our psyche as individuals, right? Okay, so, so again, we have to finance the war. We have to finance these rebels who are charging Andrew Jackson into Florida. How is he doing that? Again, as I said yesterday, think about what they're doing and what they can do because the laws, remember, the, the um, Bill of Rights, right, the amendments to the Constitution provided that military people can't come in and take over our homes, right? They can't say, hey, time of war, I need some food and you need to provide it for me. And in fact, we need all of our troops in here. It's part of the federal government. Bill of Rights said you can't do that. Well, what about going to the store, and everyone knows General Andrew Jackson needs, they know him, he's a, he's a hero, right? He's on his way to New Orleans for, during the War of 1812, so the Battle of New Orleans, and he needs supplies for his men to win that battle. So he goes to the general store, and he says, I'm Andrew Jackson, or I'm a soldier for Andrew Jackson's army, and we need supplies. Okay, here's, here's all the supplies, take what you need, and here's the bill. And we'll keep that bill, right? We'll keep that bill for you, but sometimes someone has to pay that bill. Somewhere along the line, someone is gonna have to pay that bill, right? Who pays it? Well, the states are reneging on their, on their um, bills, right? On their debts, they're not paying them. And what, they're, and what Andrew Jackson was doing to destroy the federal bank, because he actively tried to destroy the national bank, was in his powers, he was withdrawing monies from the federal bank and then depositing, depositing those monies into state banks, making them richer to pay off their debts or whatever, and never returning that money back to the federal government. This is crushing our economy and that's what started the panic of 1837 so we've got an economy that is literally collapsing under the economic decisions of president andrew jackson all right i hope that you have a better idea of what we're talking about with the national bank and then the necessity of it right because otherwise economically everybody is separate and we do not have a union right okay now is all of the underpinnings here of a civil war john c calhoun is saying we don't have to obey the federal government Andrew Jackson is obeying the federal government only when he wants to, but he's telling John C. Calhoun, you cannot, John C. Calhoun is saying, federal government, you can't make a law that's going to hurt the state, and that, by law, we don't have to obey it if it hurts us. Well, now you've got anarchy. You've got federal government laying down laws and state government saying, this law hurts us, and by law, we don't have to obey it. States rights, state law over federal government law, right? The idea that states law trumps the federal government. And so this allows for the refusal of paying certain taxes, tariffs. So Jackson's putting taxes on businesses in order to raise some of this money 
which is put crippling and then taking money out of the federal government and it's crippling the federal government. And so what we have is our first great depression where debts are mounting, money is not being backed by any system whatsoever and people are making economic deals uh, with paper, with paper, right? So I took out the Monopoly money yesterday, right? And I asked you to play that game with the banker and then you would know what was going on in the banks. That they were taking their own money to start the banks. And then they were taking everybody else's money as basically debt collectors, right? Okay. The third problem, of course, is slavery. And we're going to get more into slavery Let's also get the um, let's also get the uh, terminology right. So uh, people who are anti-slavery are abolitionists. They are abolitionists, and in fact, I think I'm probably well. We're we're getting into the Civil War. So Frederick Douglass. We're gonna we're gonna learn something about Frederick Douglass, right? And so right now, one of the problems with um, annexing states like Texas, like Florida, like Missouri, like Maine, when these states become part of the Union, the United States, when they become part of the Union, are they coming in as a slave state or as a free state? Economically speaking, the South needed slavery. And so, so, and they were, as they were adding states, the states, powers that be, wanted to be a slave state, very often wanted to be a slave state. However, you've got the executive board, basically, right? So um, the executive branch of our government, which very often was anti-slavery. And this is also where you get the division between states and federal government. Theoretically, many of the leaders were abolitionists. They were anti-slavery. John Quincy Adams, anti-slavery, right? Andrew Jackson, pro-South, pro-slavery. So we've got this movement here for individuals who are saying, uh, morally, theoretically, it's not right. Economically, the states are making the decisions to keep slavery. This is why the South is saying, I don't want to listen to the federal government's laws because they're going to tell me eventually that I can't have slaves. And that does not benefit my state. In fact, it would harm the economy of my state. So we're saying in advance that any the federal government making any law, and here's what they're preparing for, right? Making any law that hurts the state's economy, we can refuse to obey that law. And this is what the states are gearing up for. They're gearing up for the federal government to say slavery has been outlawed. And then they say, that's hurting our economy. We don't have to obey that law. So we've got the three major problems. We don't have slavery in the same. I said all of these three major problems are facing us today is what I said. So the problem of our different parties being so divisive. We still have that problem today. And also in those parties, how much power do we have as individuals compared to the power of the federal government? So that's problem number one. Problem number two, the financing of the banks. And we see that we still have this problem with banks collapsing today. Why? Because they do not have the revenue to support the economic processes that are going on. That's the best way that I can explain it, right? And now I'm saying that we still have this problem of slavery today. And, and we do, and we clearly do because we have trafficking. And trafficking is both occurring at astronomical rates. We don't even know the percentages, but because we know that the porn industry is making so much more money, even more money than the, L, uh, making so much money, even more money than the alcohol industry, we know that trafficking is very successful. And all that is is another name for slavery. 
It does, however, when we say trafficking, first of all, it feels a little better than slavery, doesn't it? But it does encompass another definition of slavery, and that's sex slaves, right? So, so we shouldn't have such a mellow, passive term as trafficking when we are talking about slavery. And more than that, we're talking about sex slaves is what we're talking about. So those three problems that we had in colonial times are still facing us as major problems today. Let's look at the points that I have there just so that we know what we're, we're talking about. Now, these are points that I've made already in this history class. So historically, I've already made these points. The Missouri Compromise of 1820 was written by Henry Clay. Um, <clears throat> Admitted, admitted Missouri as a slave state and Maine as a free state. So Henry Clay was all about uh, ensuring that we had some kind of equity in the number of free and slave states. I believe that Henry Clay was an abolitionist. I believe that I read that he was an abolitionist, but I have to find out for sure uh, if that was true. Eventually, the Missouri Compromise was overturned by popular vote. What does that mean? Not by popular vote that it was overturned, but that slavery in a state would be determined by popular vote. So we no longer kept, had to keep a balance of free and slave states. We allowed the states to decide for themselves. And then also, we've, as we've read, as I read from the speeches, we have the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which brought about the Trail of Tears, and we don't need to go into that again, right? So we already know everything that we need to know about that. Again, what I want to really emphasize here is that we are facing the same problem of slavery here. We have a muted uh, characterization of it by calling it trafficking instead of slavery. However, when we called it slavery, it really did focus on work slavery when there certainly was sexual abuse going on at the time as well. So using the word trafficking, we, we think more of the sex aspect of it instead of the work trafficking. Both of those still are, still exist, right? In the same way that they did here. So work and sex slavery is now called work and sex trafficking. Slavery is now called trafficking, and we still have it today. Of course, of course we do. All right, now we're going to go ahead and get to uh, president number eight, nine, and ten. I'm going to try and do that, all right? All right, so Martin Van Buren was a uh, Andrew Jackson's vice president. And so he stood and supported everything that Andrew Jackson said. So he was a Democrat. He was a Jacksonian. So remember, Jacksonians were uh, Democrats. They, were, they called themselves Democrats. They needed a party. You can't just be a Jacksonian. And, and this is what I'm reading about. Even one of the problems with... Um, the difficulty in um, Tyler replacing Harrison was, is he representing a party? What's your party? Because your party has a platform. Andrew Jackson had no platform. Andrew Jackson did what Andrew Jackson wanted to, which is why his party was Jacksonian right? But you can't do that. Who's the next president? The Jacksonian party? What does that mean? Everything Andrew Jackson does, that's what it means. Hello? No, we need a party with a political foundation. Van Buren was able to run on, do I have that spelled right now? I do. Uh, Van Buren was able to run on the fact that he was a Jacksonian. Uh, and that was very popular at the time in particular because we were fighting wars with Indians. And so any warrior, any soldier coming out of the American Revolution or the War of 1812 that's fighting the Indians is seen as a real hero, right? Well, what's that party? The Indian fighters, right? The Indian massacres, massacres. Is that what the party's called, 
right? No, you obviously can't call your. So here's where I started with this. The posturing, their posturing. Am what's better in the people's eyes? Andrew Jackson ended up being a wealthy person. Was he rags to riches? He was rags to riches. But it was hard for him to represent rags any longer, especially when he sort of had this dictator attitude. So Martin Van Buren, he was the eighth president of the United States from 1837 to, to 1841. He was called the little magician, a very small man, five foot six inches, or maybe five foot four, I can't remember, but a small man. Little magician because he seemed to be getting himself out of predicaments. And that really was with the help of the reputation of Andrew Jackson, son of a tavern keeper and farmer from New York, not from Virginia, northern leader for Andrew Jackson. And then Andrew Jackson appointed him vice president. Um, so, so Andrew Jackson was supporting ideology for the South in the South. Van Buren was supporting ideology for the South in the North. Jacksonian Democrats. Van Buren was supporting that in the North. He was from New York. And so this was, he was able to give, get a lot of electoral votes. And Andrew Jackson won the state of New York. So New York primarily would not have gone for uh, a, a pro-slavery, pro-war with the Indians character except for Van, Van Buren was his leader, and they knew Van Buren's. Van Buren's had a good reputation in New York. And so as the leader of the Jacksonian party, Van Buren was able to help Jackson in the North uh, because he was from New York. He opposed the federal banks and federal deposits in state, state banks. So both... So any money that was coming from the federal government was seen to was looked at as elitist money and uh, was not uh, and uh, they didn't want to take it. They want they did not want to be dependent or incumbent to. Is that the right word? I think it is uh, to the federal government in any way. Continuing Jackson's deflationary politics our policies deepened the U.S. depression and that became the panic of 1837. They were all the policies and the tariffs and the taxing on businesses and trade that Andrew Jackson put into place, but Van Buren ended up having the, the, the fallout because of it, which meant he was only going to be a one-term president. He blocked the annexation of Texas. And the reason why he did, Van Buren was a fierce opponent of slavery. So that's where him and Jackson actually had a divide. Why was Van Buren against Texas becoming part of the Union? So here we have the Alamo, and they allowed uh, um, the massacre of, was it 3,000 individuals in Alabama, right, fighting there? I'm sorry, Alabama. At the Alamo in Texas. Why? Because they didn't want to annex Texas. Why didn't they want Texas to be part of the Union? Van Buren said it would surely be a slave state, and we didn't want any more slave states. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? So there's a reason for not going to the Alamo but it, but it had to do more with personal beliefs than it did with what was good for those people who wanted independence in the same way that all of those people who started this country wanted independence. Okay, all right. Ooh, it's Michigan, and it's cold in Michigan. It's June, the middle of June. And I can't turn my heat on, but I do have my little heater next to me. Okay. And he was defeated by the Whigs in 1840. So, so you know, and then finished out his, you know, the inauguration through 1841 for the new president, right? So 1841 was the start of the new president and the end of Van Buren's reign as president. And again, 
what he was powerfully defeated. It was by a landslide that he was defeated, something like 90 electoral votes to 300 electoral votes. Um, why? Why was he? Well, because there was really an outpouring of um, no, real negative feeling, an outpouring of venom towards the Jacksonian party the Democrats of the time and Whigs, as I said, came to be primarily as simply an opponent of Jackson and all of Andrew Jackson's um, minions, which Van Buren would have been a minion, would have been really working for Jackson, right? Okay, so... Uh, Shortest term as president, 32 days. We can see here, I said, posturing was what William Henry Harrison did. He had a three-hour inaugural speech that he made in the cold, in January, in the cold, without any overcoat on. He caught a chill, a cold, pneumonia, and died 32 days later. His inaugural speech was three over three hours long. He portrayed himself as a backwoodsman, born in a log cabin, when he was actually very wealthy. All of this, all of William Henry Harrison, seems to have been about posturing. Let's go to, in our last minute or so, I want to go to our book that I have here. Uh, the History of the American Presidency by John, by John Bowman. And um, look at the pictures, right? Because they always give us a little bit of information. So there's not a lot of information on the next three presidents, President 8, 9, and 10. Uh, Harrison, because he was only there for 32 days, although there's enough information about him. And Van Buren, a one-term president. So, and, and somebody who really just duplicated Andrew Jackson's um, efforts. And so, not, not, maybe not so unique. So, let's take a look at some unique things. Here, left, Martin Van Buren was elected 8th President of the United States in 1837. His town was, his term was overshadowed by financial panic, right? So, the panic of, what was that again? I want to get the date right. Panic of 1837. I should have known that because it's the end of uh, Jackson's term. 1837. Here you've got slaves on the Underground Railroad being smuggled north to freedom. Though Van Buren refused to offer the slightest opposition to slavery, he predicted it would eventually end amid terrible conclusions. Oops, I should take that down here so you can see. And so, so Van Buren predicted civil war because of the issue of slavery. And again, didn't I say that he was vehemently opposed to slavery? It's interesting because he said not the slightest, he didn't offer the slightest opposition, but I've read that he was very vehemently opposed to it, vehemently opposed to slavery. Let's read in our next minute and go a little bit longer about William Henry Harrison. So here we've got the ninth president of the United States, William Henry Harrison, the candidate for the new Whig Party. He was elected by an overwhelming majority thanks to Whig campaign tactics, which were basically just more mudslinging but Andrew Jackson, and also that the tariffs that people didn't want to pay were creating the panic that we saw. And, and because of all of that, a new party was welcome. There was great depression going on in the United States. Left right here, Hard Cider and Log Cabin Almanac, 8, 1841. Right? So, hurry for your tippicate for, for, or, uh, hurrah. Hurrah for old tippicanoe. Posturing again. He it was the, the campaign was Tippecanoe and Tyler too. His vice president was John Tyler. Tippecanoe was the battle that he had won against the Indians. So he also was an Indian warrior 
uh, fought the Shawnee Indians. I think I have that. I, I do have that on the slide. Fought the Shawnee Indians in Indiana. Was famous actually for, uh, he was responsible for uh, the killing of one of the one of the leaders of the Shawnee, Tecumseh. So he was responsible for the murder of the Shawnee leader. But Shawnee Indians in Indiana at the Battle of Tippecanoe and then won the presidency. You can see many people are winning in popularity by through their battles with the American Indians and winning those battles with the American Indians. How could you have turned history around? How could you have turned that around and said, we need to do something different. We should do something different when they were getting voted in left and right. Primarily, primarily because of their war and tactics with the American Indians. This is Dr. Annette Farovich. We will get to president number 10. We are on president number nine. And then we'll also get to Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, and uh, Daniel Webster, none of whom have been were presidents, but really had an impact on this country. So I'll be back tomorrow with some of that information. Thanks for joining me. I'm Dr. Annette Farovich. I'm the teacher here in the Bookless Classroom. I will see you tomorrow at 915.